morning. My name is Matthew, I'm your campus pastor here at Point Church Cary. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Go ahead and grab a pen. Uh, when you came in, you should have received a program. On the back, there is a place to take notes. Also, you have uh, devices that you can, whether it's an iPhone or an Android, I don't care. There's something you can write on. Um, and so I believe that God is going to speak to you today. I believe he's going to give you things you can take home and apply. Um, and so I don't know about you, but if you were to ask me to tell you, hey, what did I say in last week's sermon or the week before that? I might not remember, but I can pull up my notes. Um, and so I encourage you to be note takers because because note takers are more likely to apply the things they hear. Um, how many of y'all remember what it was like as a kid to play red light, green light? Anybody? Okay. Some of you don't, it's okay. Let me, I can introduce you to this very simple game, okay? Um, I used to play this uh, when I used to work in the YMCA. Um, I used to be uh, like in our neighborhood. We have a playground right across the street from our house and like the kids used to love me. And now it's sad because now like I used to go over and play with them and we'd play across the ocean and red light, green light. And now the kids are too cool to talk to me anymore. But anyways, I used to be cool in Arbor Creek and we would do things like red light, green light. And the way it works is all the kids line up uh, here and the goal is to get to the other end of this worship center. Um, and they're waiting and they have to follow instructions. If you don't follow instructions, you can't win the game. When the light is green, everybody can run as fast as they can. And then it's when it says red light, everybody stops. And then they try to get tricky and like, you know, you think they're going to say green and they're like, green, red, you know, and they say things because if you actually go uh, when the light is red, you're out. Okay. And so that is the goal uh, is to get across. Um, and you know, it's something that every kid understands when you're playing red light and green light is you understand your position. You understand who you are in the game. You are not the person in charge of the game. You are not the person calling the shots. You do not have the ability to say red or you do not have the ability to say green. You are in the position that you have to wait for the light to turn red or you have to wait for the light to turn green. That's it. You're not the signal caller. You don't press the buttons. But here's the thing that I find interesting as I spiritualize red light, green light for a second, is I feel like what we do as followers of Jesus is we live our life perpetually in a state as if the light is green. And, and, and we live as if it's constantly green and we just wait for God to turn the light stop because we're the ones that press the green light and he's kind of our safety in case we do something dumb and he's the one that presses the red light. It, it, it's, you know, instead of like as a kid, I understood I am not the one to press green or red. And as followers of Jesus, something for us to realize is that we are not the people that are the ones that create our own plans. We don't create our own green lights. We are people that are meant to say, hey, if you say green, I will go. If the light's red, I will stop. But very often, I think what we do is that we look at God as the one that we live in the light as green because we make good plans. We're smart. We have calendars. We do these things. And you're here just to protect me against my own stupidity instead of actually being the source of my steps. Do we see God as being the protector of our stupidity or the source of our steps? And the thing is, I think too often we're saying, hey, I appreciate when you're the red light. I'm so glad you're there to stop me when I'm not doing something I'm supposed to. But what if we applied the little kids game to our walk and said, hey, I am constantly in a posture and a place of being with you and abiding. If you say green, I go. If you don't say green, I stay put because the light's still red. What if we said, hey, I'm not the one who writes my agenda and my plans for my life. The one who presses the button of green and red is the one who was meant to do that in my life. Uh, the goal this morning is to learn to live a life that is, be, what does it look like to be someone who lives a life that is led by the Holy Spirit? The book of Acts, uh, subtitle is Acts of the Holy Spirit. And so what we see throughout the book of Acts is there are people that are continually led by the Holy Spirit. And I want that to be an encouragement to us practically in our everyday lives is let's step off uh, the control of controlling the green and let's step off trying to even say, hey God, I'd like you to stop telling me to do that. We don't press red or green. We wait in a posture of saying, you turn on the light and you tell me what to do. And so the first thing uh, that I want us to look at today is this. Uh, you, you're gonna have a lot of passages you can write down. It's another Sunday where we're gonna look at kind of how do we see the Holy Spirit leading the church in the book of Acts, okay? And how does that impact our life today? Um, here's the first thing. Um, the followers of Jesus in the book of Acts, the followers of Jesus didn't act without the leading of the Holy Spirit. This is important, okay? The, the church in Acts did not act without the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know, this does not just apply to people in ministry. You are all in ministry, your life is a ministry. So I don't want you just to make sure you go to a church that sought the Lord for a vision for the church. I want us to be a church that everybody here seeks the vision of God for their life. Okay? And so the red light, green light thing matters here is that we don't seek to do anything with our life without the leading of the Holy Spirit. 
okay? That like the decisions we make daily matter. Is this what you're leading me to do? Are you calling me to stop this? And so what we're going to look at here is I'm going to give a survey of some examples in the book of Acts where they made major decisions, but they were not their decisions. They just did what they were told. Okay, so we see in Acts chapter 5, uh, we see that the apostles were arrested. Why? Because they were preaching the gospel. And then it says that an angel in Acts 5 verse 20, it says an angel broke them out of jail. And then the angel spoke, go stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about the new life. This new life that you get to live. Listen, um, if an angel breaks me out of jail, the common sense logical thing to do is I'm going to run. That is the plan. The green light is very bright right now. I am gone. But the angel actually said, can you just go back to where you got arrested? I just want you to know that if you're open to the Holy Spirit leading you, it won't always be to what makes sense to you. Because what makes sense to you might not lead to the greatest impact for his kingdom. It might not lead to the thing that brings him the most glory. But you know what I love about this? Every example I'm about to give, the Lord leads in different ways and speaks in different ways, whether it's an angel, uh, whether it's a vision, these different things. But when we see the Holy Spirit lead here, they obey. We're going to come back to that. Their obedience after the revelation really, really matters. We see in Acts chapter 8, uh, this has been referenced already. This is Acts 8, 26 uh, through 29. It says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Philip, we learned in Acts 6, was one of the deacons, one of the chief servants of the church. Um, what I love about this, he wasn't asking God for a revelation. He wasn't asking God for a word. He wasn't asking God for what to do today. It just says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip. What I love about that is Philip must have been the type of person that lived his life in a posture that, he, that God knew, you know what? I can just call on Philip right now. I can just call on him. And it says, Philip, go south to the road, to the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Um, when I read this, I'm like, could you not have given me some more direction? Just go to the road. Like, how about why? How about how far? And so often that's the thing that I think can get us is the Holy Spirit might lead us and we're stuck on the why when he just said go. And we're stuck on how far when he said, I'll tell you when to stop. And so he just starts going down this road. Like, okay, I love that he does that. Like how many of us would just be stuck and like, well, like I'll go down the road when you say when to stop and at what exit. But it says here, then he jumped down. Um, he goes on the road and it says he started. Um, so he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chair, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. Then in verse 29, he gets his next message. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Like, God, like, this is creepy. <laughs> like, like, I'd rather you just tell me to go talk to the dude, like, not just stand near it. But all he gave him was, hey, I'll give you more when you need it. Just go stand near the chariot. And you know what's amazing about when the Holy Spirit leads the church in Acts? The things that don't make sense end up going exactly the way that God wanted, and it works out beautifully. Because as he goes and he stands near the chariot, what happens is the Ethiopian eunuch calls him to him. He asks him to explain the book of Isaiah to him. He shares Jesus with him. This Ethiopian eunuch, which is huge for the diversity of the church coming from Africa, he gets baptized. It's phenomenal. But why did this happen? Because God spoke and Philip obeyed. God spoke and Philip obeyed. We see, we see this in Acts chapter 9. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had the honor of Glenn Plastina come in and preach a message on the life of Paul. What we see is the apostle Paul at this time was known as Saul in Acts 9. He was a persecutor of the church, killing people that were followers of Jesus. Jesus appeared to him on the road of Damascus, called him to be the person that took the message of Jesus to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish world, and he was blinded and there were scales on his eyes. And then it says this in Acts chapter chapter 9, verse 10, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Ananias is like, again, revelation doesn't always make sense. Lord, he says, I have heard many reports that this man and all, um, this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. And then it says in verse 17, then Ananias went. Then Ananias went. The Holy Spirit called him to go to a man who was killing Christians. Man, let me tell you something. A lot... Our, our willingness to say yes to God matters because it affects people's lives. Can you imagine the story of Acts and the story of the New Testament had Ananias been like, nah. 
But Ananias did go and he laid hands on him and he prayed over him and he was filled with the Holy Spirit and the scales fell off his eyes and he was baptized and he went on to become the one that wrote two thirds of the New Testament. Why? Because God spoke and Ananias said yes. God, no, let me, does it say anywhere here that Ananias was praying for like, hey God, like I just need you to give me a plan for today. No, it just says now he spoke to him and he asked him to do this. Each of these occasions, you have a pattern here of these people being people that God thought he could trust with a message because if he gave it to them, he thought they would do it. I'm gonna sum up these and we'll come back to them. But in Acts chapter 10, what we see is Cornelius was praying at three in the afternoon and he had a vision. Send men to Joppa and bring Peter back. And he did it. Weird thing. How would you feel if like you're praying and God gives you a vision and says, hey, can you send two of your employees to another town to get a guy named Peter I've never met before? It's like that, I, God, like I, 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 I how can I ask my employees, my men, to go to the city and ask for a man I've never met before? If we want God to speak to us, okay, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I believe many of you are followers of Jesus, and I believe that God still speaks today. I love his scriptures. That is his written word, but I believe the Holy Spirit has been put into us to speak to us, to comfort us, to reveal his truth to us. He is still speaking to us and wanting to guide our everyday steps. That is what he wants to do, but here's the thing. I have very often said, I want to hear God speak but listen, do you want to do what he's going to say? Do you actually want God to speak? Because what we'll see in all these patterns here that I've read, he spoke and he told them to go. The message of the, the voice of God wants to speak to us, but he's looking for vessels that already have a yes on the table. And so if you say you want to hear God, know that God's going to call you probably to people and places. He's gonna call you to people in places and it's not always gonna make sense and it won't always compute and people might not understand. But do we understand, hey, we say, I want an assignment from God, man. I wish he'd tell me to do something. He's gonna give you an assignment, but you have to trust the assigner. You've gotta trust the assigner because the assignment won't always make sense. It says that later in Acts 10 that Peter's on a roof praying at noon and he goes into a trance and has a vision and he's like, hey, there's two guys coming for you, a couple guys coming for you. I need you to go with them to this other town. And you know what? He went. Yeah, I can imagine calling my wife being like, hey, babe, um, I was just praying today up in the worship center and um, God gave me a vision that like this guy's about to roll up in a car and I'm supposed to get in a car with him and I'm supposed to go to Andrew and like I'm supposed to talk to these people about Jesus. Like, I don't know in what world, like that, that's not responsible, that's not safe, all these, but like that's kind of the level of like how ridiculous this seems here. But this is what God calls Peter to do. Why is this a big deal? Because his obedience led to the transformation of these people in Cornelius' house. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They became messengers of Jesus in the region they lived in. Let me give one more example, Acts 13, 2. This is the church in Antioch. We looked at them when we talked about the diversity of the Spirit. It says, the leaders in the church in Antioch, it says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, we'll come back to that, the Holy Spirit set apart uh, said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they'd fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Paul and Barnabas get sent out on a missionary journey. They weren't even planning to leave. What happened? Just a group of people praying and worshiping and fasting. And what happened? God says, that's the type of people I know I can speak to. That's the type of people I know I can speak to because they're ready. Um, let me give a couple points here under that first point is this. Um, obedience to the Spirit's leading is imperative. Obedience to the Spirit's leading is imperative. I already mentioned this. Um, God is looking to speak to people that already have a yes on the table. He's, already look, he's looking to speak to people who already have a yes on the table. Um, I know that we can all think we're smart and that we have good ideas, but let me tell you something. None of us are God, and he's not looking to you. He's not looking to speak to you because you have great plans. He's looking to speak to you because you might trust his great plans. Okay, your plans don't impress God, but he likes to speak to people who are impressed by the plans that he wants to deliver. Um, if you want God to speak to you, be prepared to, for him to tell you to do something and to go somewhere and to go to someone. Um, here's something that God convicted me of this week. Um, every one of these messages that God gave required obedience. And I can't say that I crave the voice of God if I don't also crave to obey God. I think God is looking for people that actually crave obedience. And man, like, I feel like that's what a spiritually, a, a spiritually mature person looks like. Some of my heroes in the faith I've met, like, man, they just love obeying God. And I'm like, man, like, I feel like myself at times, I, and maybe you can relate, you're still stuck in like that little kid place of like, well, I'll do it because you told me. Man, how much more pleasurable would it be 
to be a son or a daughter of the king that's not just begrudgingly obeying the father, but saying, man, I actually love obeying my father. Because if I want to be someone who hears his voice, I also have to be someone who wants to obey his voice. Because listen, can I just tell you this? Let me just, our relationship with God is a, communi- is a communicative relationship. How many of you like talking to somebody and you tell them to do things and they never do it? Uh, parents? Bosses? Anybody that's over anybody at work? Like, who, like, what happens after a while if you just keep telling somebody to do something and they don't do it? Eventually, You don't trust that person to do it and you find someone else to do the thing. And I think sometimes I wonder that if we're like, man, like I just feel like God never speaks to me. I wonder if he has many times, but when he speaks, you don't do. And he said, I'll find someone else that will. I think the people I found that hear the Lord's voice the most are the people that obey the word that they receive. And man, I don't ever want to be somebody who God says, I'm gonna find someone else to speak to. I wanna be somebody who he says, I can talk to him all day, every day. Because when I speak, he hears and he listens and he does. Our obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit is imperative. It's imperative that we do that. Also, I don't know if you've noticed this. Um, obedience leads to receiving more revelation from the Lord. I, in my times where I can tell you I've heard the Holy Spirit leading me in my life, it would be the times I'm most obedient to the Lord. It's just the truth. Like, it's not the times that I'm caught up in sin. It's not the time when I'm playing with idols. It's the time when I'm most devoted to him. When I am most devoted to him are the times that I hear his voice most clearly. Um, Also wanna just bring up a little point here. Um, Another passage, this is in Acts chapter 16. This is a hard one, okay? Little phrase, not all good plans are God's plans. Not all good plans are are God's plans. We see this in Acts chapter 16 and verse six through 10. You can jot that down and go look at it. It says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Y'all catch that? The Holy Spirit actually prevented and kept them from preaching the word in this province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So, we, so they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen in a vision, uh, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach to them. Um, the body of Christ is made up of a lot of different people, and God calls us in his own plans and his own ways to go to certain people and to do certain things. And here's the thing. Listen, there are times when it's like, hey, God's called us to go and make disciples of all nations. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna be in a posture to, to share the gospel with certain people. But man, like, like sometimes there are things that make sense. They're logical. They're biblical things. They're good things that he might say, wait, actually, I want you to do that over there. Or actually not today. I have somebody else to do that. Something we have to consider sometimes is we can't just mow forward with good plans because they might not be God's plans. Like, if you, like, you might chapter and verse and say, there's nothing wrong with it. And he's like, I agree. It's not wrong biblically, but it's not right according to my purpose in your life right now. Because I actually am leading you over here and not over here. Because that's for them. This is for you. And what I love is, if he would have gone, he would not have received the vision of the man in Macedonia saying, coming here. Because you know what happens? Is sometimes our good plans become our plans and not God's plans. That can be difficult is it's like, well, I know this is good. Uh, maybe this has even happened. You've been responsible financially. It's like, hey, like I can tell you this. This is what I'm supposed to do. This makes sense. Like why would God ever say not do this? Because he might be saying, give that. There's things we have to always have a pause of and say, hey, is this God's plan or is this my plan? Here's the second thing I want you to see. Uh, the followers of Jesus here in Acts weren't begging God for purpose in their life or a mission, but they found their purpose in his presence. Okay, I want to unpack this. None of these examples are like, hey, hey, show me what to do. Show me what to do. Again, please understand, preaching sermons is stressful. Okay, here's why. There's nothing wrong with asking God what to do. Okay, there's nothing wrong with crying out to help. But my point is, in most of these examples, what we have here, except for Acts 1, when they're trying to replace Judas, every example we get here, they weren't seeking specific direction. Not that that's wrong, but they were just seeking God or they were just present with God. And I think this matters. Um, I think sometimes we can be overly obsessed with God's will for our lives. 
um, when I was leading a youth group at Apex Baptist back in the day, like that was the number one thing kids kept coming up and asking me. And God really put it on my heart to research that. And the phrase God's will, if I remember correctly, was only found in the New Testament twice. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, it says this, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is God's will. Like what? Like that's God's will. Yeah. So what is God's will for me today? Well, am I being joyful? Am I praying continually? Am I giving thanks in all circumstances? Listen, if I'm willing to surrender to that will, then I'm in a posture to receive his specific will. It, but if he doesn't find me joyful and thankful, if he doesn't find me in that place, then like, who am I to even be seeking a specific thing when I'm not seeking the one true thing? And so what I want us to notice here is a couple things. I'm, I'm gonna give you a phrase that I think is good, okay? And so sometimes I'm like, hey man, maybe they'll write down some things. I'm telling you, write down this dang thing, okay? This one. Posture leads to presence. Presence leads to purpose. Posture leads to presence. Presence leads to purpose. Let me give you these two two examples here that I think really unpack this. We'll go back to these passages I've already looked at. In Acts chapter 10, verse 3, it says, Cornelius was praying at three in the afternoon and had a vision. It does not say he was asking God for any specific thing about what he was supposed to do or like, hey, like, I'm really like wondering, is there anybody in Joppa that I'm supposed to? Like, Like, he was just praying. And I want you to understand, prayer is a posture. And so he was posturing some himself to be in the presence of God. His posture led to the presence, and in his presence came specific purpose. Posture leads to presence. Presence leads to purpose. Also, I just love that it just seems like this regular thing that Cornelius does. It's just three in the afternoon he's praying. And here's something to note is the Jewish people, uh, they would have hours of prayer. Okay, like, they, like you see in Acts, it says at the 3 a.m. at 3 a.m. hour, Peter and John were going to the temple to pray. Um, Can I just say this? I feel like sometimes we've made a knee-jerk reaction to say religion is bad, okay? I say bad religion is bad. (laughs) Like, there is good value in having healthy rhythms. We all have rhythms, okay? Let me tell you an unhealthy rhythm. My wife's right here in front of me. I can confess to this. We were watching something on Hulu the other night. Hulu still has commercials. At least we do because we're not willing to pay the, you know, the amount to not have the commercials. So, you know, we have the Hulu with commercials. And the commercial comes on. You know what we do? The commercial comes on. We both grab our phones and look at it. It's just what we do. It's just like this thing. I was like, all oh, the commercials on, so I need to look at this before that comes back on. You know, that is, that, that's a rhythm that's been ingrained. We all have things that we wake up and we do this. When I wake up, I do that. When I wake up or someone says this, I do that. Or when I get in the car. What we see here is Cornelius had put himself in a place of having healthy rhythms of prayer and healthy rhythms of prayer put him in a posture to be in his presence. And when he was in his presence, he could receive specific purpose. You know, there's actually throughout church history, there's something to this. Is like the monks, like in the monasteries, they would like they would have a the, they was some, there was something called the liturgy of the hours. At six a.m., they would gather together and pray and read scripture. At nine o'clock, and twelve o'clock, and three o'clock, and six o'clock, like every three hours, they would stop whatever they were doing, and they would pray. You're like, well, I can't do that. Why not? Let me ask you this: If you've been at work before, have you ever stopped to check your phone and check Facebook? Like was. Like, okay, so you can stop work. So like, what if during your day, it's like, hey, like Cornelius just happened to have a rhythm in his life that he prayed at three o'clock. And because of that, God said, this is a person who regularly postures himself in my presence. We also see what happens. Next day, Peter, same type of guy, noon, he's up on the roof praying. Praying at noon and praying at three. Let me give you next steps before the end of the sermon. Hey, you know what? I'm not saying, hey, the Bible says you have to pray at three and you have to pray at noon. I'm not saying that. But hey, you know what? What if you took a, take a step this week to create a rhythm in your life to posture yourself throughout your day in his presence? What if it's like, hey, I'm gonna set an alarm on my phone at 12 and an alarm on my phone at three, like Cornelius and Peter. I'm gonna stop whatever I'm doing. I'm gonna take some time just to posture myself in his presence through prayer and I'm going to just be with him. And if he so fits, wants to reveal something, fine. But you know what? I, God does not need to reveal something specific for me to actually find value in his presence because he's ultimately valuable. And if he says something specific, great. If not, I'm with him. What if you said, hey, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, I'll set an alarm this week. The Cornelius and Peter challenge. Take it this week. Go for it. You know, at lunch, instead of just sitting there and, you know, and, and looking at your phone or whatever it might be, just say, hey, you know what? I'm going to actually spend time in his presence during lunch this week. Um, what I love, though, is in both examples, they weren't asking for something specific. They were just postured in his presence. They were just with him, and God spoke. Um, also, we see in Acts chapter 13, the church leaders in Antioch. I love this. Paul and Barnabas get sent out on this crazy mission. Man, what led to that? 
Like what led to them getting, like what brainstorming session did they have to get sent out to like go on a missionary trip? When they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, when they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, man, like if I want to be someone that lives my life and hears times in my life where the Holy Spirit said, I've got to have a posture in my life where I'm worshiping and I'm praying and I'm fasting that I'm worshiping and I'm praying and I'm fasting because they weren't even, they weren't having a meeting to figure out what in the world are we gonna do with Paul and Barnabas? Like they're here in our town and we gotta get them out. Like they're, surely God wants to send them somewhere. No, they were just worshiping and fasting and the Holy Spirit said, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I've called. So after they'd fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. Let me give you, the, we see worship, fasting, and prayer. Uh, another thing that can go on the screen is that worship, prayer, and fasting are vehicles for hearing the voice of the Spirit. Worship, prayer, and fasting are vehicles for hearing the voice of the Spirit. Why? Well, worship puts me in a posture of adoration. And I believe God's looking for those that adore him to give him things to do for him. If God doesn't see you adoring him in worship, he might not be sending you something to do with his specific voice. Also, um, like prayer. Prayer is a position of posture that says, I actually want to commune with God. God's not looking to speak something specifically to people that actually specifically don't want to be with him. Fasting is a posture before God of dependence. I know very often we think that, hey, um, we tend to look at fasting in the church of, hey, if you're looking for an answer from God, fast until you get it. I'm not saying that's not right. I'm just saying they were just fasting. It's a spiritual discipline through much of like the, the, the church has practiced throughout church history. It's not always something to do because you're in desperate need. It's something to do because you're just in complete dependence of needing him at all times. And fasting reminds me, I need him. I don't need to just fast when something went bad in my life. I need to fast when something's good in my life because I need to always remember I need my Lord. And so fasting and worship and prayer are vehicles for hearing the voice of the Spirit. Let me give this fourth thing, um, and, and this is a big one for me. Um, all the examples I gave of God speaking in the book of Acts. I just want to go over what they were, okay? Um, the Holy Spirit spoke through visions. Peter went into a trance. Angels showed up on the scene. The Spirit spoke, and Jesus spoke. It's like, man, like, I want God to speak, but like, I don't know about those things. I just want to give you a challenge, pastorally and lovingly. If you want God to speak, don't beg him to speak in ways that are different than the ways that he did. I want you to ask, I want myself, I say, God, would you increase my faith that I would have faith that you want to speak to me in any way that you want to speak to me? Let's not put God in a box and say, hey, I'm only comfortable if you speak this way. Because who am I to tell God how to speak? To say, hey, God, like, if you want to speak to me through a vision, you're like, what is a vision? Like, this is crazy. Like, who has visions? Anybody ever daydream before? Okay, um, call it like so. Like a lot of times, that's I'm daydreaming because I'm just thinking about this thing. I think sometimes we don't realize that maybe God has spoken to us in ways that we haven't even realized. Have you ever been in a, like maybe even a time of prayer or a time of worship, and something just got brought to your mind, or like an image or a remembrance of a thing or, or something you long for? Like these actually can be God speaking to you. It can be God showing you something to remind you of something or to point you to something. Um, like Peter, it's like, I don't know what a trance looked like, but I can tell you he was consumed with the presence of God at that moment. Am I open to being just like, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna posture myself in your presence. You can have all of me right now. Like fill my mind. Also dreams, God spoke through dreams in the Bible. Um, I'm tired of nightmares. How about fill me with holy dreams? How about say, hey God, if there's anything, like I'm gonna sleep and it's yours. Like I'm gonna, and if there's something you want to show me, what I see here is these are people that were just receptacles that were ready for God to download and they had the faith to say, hey, like, like man, like if an angel showed up, I'm running. Like, like that'd be weird. For them, it's like an angel broke me out of prison and like, what's the assignment? These are my kind of people. It's like the angel showed up and said, I need you to go speak in the temple and they went. And so like, my point is this, is that God spoke in so many different ways throughout scripture. These are just a few. But I will tell you this. In the same way that Jesus, you know, he did miracles in certain places, but he even said Nazareth, that there was faith lacking in that place. I do think a component of hearing the voice of God is having faith that God actually wants to speak to you in the first place. And I want you to know, I believe that God is still a speaking God. God still cares about you specifically. He still wants to encourage you through his Holy Spirit in specific ways, whether that's just giving you comfort. You can go throughout the rest of Acts. I'm not gonna go into this in sermon because a lot of times my sermons are much longer than they should be. So here's a whole other sermon I could, which is the Holy Spirit encouraging 
Paul as he's heading towards his own arrest, as he's heading towards Jerusalem, and he comforts him. The Holy Spirit doesn't just give you assignments, he also gives you comfort. And let me ask you, if part of receiving is having faith to receive, and part of receiving is having faith to say, however you did it or however you desire to, I am in a posture to be in your presence, you hold the green light, you hold the red light, you say what you want to say, you say it how you want to and say to do what you want and tell me what to do. My yes is on the table. And so it's just, the point is this, in your posture, be open to any means of revelation by the Spirit. I don't know what that looks like, but be open. If we're not open to the Spirit, we're probably not going to see a move of the Spirit in our lives. That's just true. So as I wrap up, I just want to go through these things again. Hey, are you holding the red light or the green light in your life? Do you just want God to be the stop for you and you be the green? It's not gonna work. He is God. He is the author of our lives. He's the one that wants to guide us and lead us. And it's like, hey, what does that look like in my life this week? Hey, well, maybe you take out your calendar and and, and maybe as you look at that, say, hey, no, God, this is what's on my calendar. Is there anything you want to reveal to me about any of these things? Maybe it's not to do one of them. Maybe it's something specific you want me to do at one of them. Maybe it's actually as I go about my day making my plans, it's like, hey, Lord, um, I have this opportunity. What do you think? The problem is we live our life too often with our plans and then God has to say stop because we never actually ask him to be involved. How often would he not have to put on the red light if we just actually communed with him the whole entire time and said, hey, one, it's one thing to say, hey, this is an opportunity. It's another thing just to say, hey, here's my life today. What would you have me do? Hey, God, I happen to be in Lucky 32 today. Is there anybody you want me to talk to? Hey, God, I'm driving down the road. Is there anybody you want me to call? Like just constantly being on assignment. But also, it's not just begging God for what to do. It's just begging God for himself and his presence. And in that place, he'll give you things to do. So ask yourself today, am I I controlling the green light in my life? Or am I controlling the red light in my life? Um, Also, I just want to encourage you. that posture leads to presence and presence leads to purpose. Um, If you're wanting God to reveal any specific purpose in your life, you need to be putting yourself in a posture to be in his presence because that's where he reveals himself. And so I encourage you, make space. We're about to sing a song of not just being Sunday Christians, okay? Listen, uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed, um, but Sunday is not enough gas in your spiritual tank to get you to the next Sunday. In fact, it's not enough to get you to the end of the night because it doesn't work like that. The word abiding doesn't mean abide now and abide later. It means abide. Be with him, commune with him, and don't stop. That's why it says pray without ceasing. And so we're gonna sing the song. I think it's gonna help us to understand that. But I wanna encourage you, create rhythms in your day, not just at one point, but throughout your day that lead you to be in a posture of his presence and purpose comes from presence. And I'm excited to see what happens when we become a people that when he speaks, we obey. That when he speaks, we obey. What what if he saw, you know what? There's something unique about these people in Cary that I can speak to that church, not just that pastor, not just that leader, not just that life group leader. I can speak to that church, those people. When I speak, they listen and they do. And man, that's a vehicle for God to speak more. And when he speaks more, he'll lead us to do so much more for him and so much more impact in his kingdom. Father, we love you.